There we go. There we go. There we go. Well, I thank you very much for joining us today. Last night in the bigger Corso Cinema, uh, it was an extraordinary outburst of passionate commitment to the characters you've created over such a long period. Um, and today, in this masterclass, you've been kind enough to give us some time to talk about, uh, let's say, the more discreet side of your personality, the, the personality of the writer, uh, the personality of the director, uh, who I wouldn't say is self-effacing, but someone who is uh, content to remain in the background, in the case of Staying Alive, for example, many people think of that as a John Travolta movie. Yeah, they don't right. think any further. And in fact, you've done... Exactly. And... Uh, I was thinking last night how few people there are in the history of the cinema who've managed to be major stars and direct and write in the way that you have done over such a long period. I mean, you could name them on two fingers or two hands. You've got Charles Chaplin, you've got Orson Welles, <laughs> Laurence Olivier, wow. and Clint Eastwood near our times. But you, have, you belong in that select band. Thank you. And uh, you've written, I believe, over 20 screenplays. You've directed uh, 10 or so films. And when you, when you look back on your career, of those three crafts, the acting, the writing, the directing, which, is, which would you say is the most demanding? The writing, mm -hmm. no question, because the writing is make or break. It's also the most singular of all the arts. It's you and the page, and quite often it, it causes you to go very deep inside and that also can bring out great deals of, uh, a great deal of insecurity because if you cannot deliver the story to be able to communicate to people, you start doubting yourself mm -hmm. and then quite often you get writer's block and, there, and I had to teach myself early on, expect to fail. Mm -hmm. Expect it. Covet it. Welcome it. It's going to happen, mm -hmm. but don't, it's not a permanent state. Right. And, and so, but without a doubt, we were talking about it. Directing is the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. It's like you're now. You know, it's one thing to write the music; it's another to conduct the orchestra. Yeah. That's the best. But also, uh, you came in at a time when Final Cut was yeah. gradually becoming the norm, as opposed to the '50s and '60s when it was a battle. Exactly right. And we have to thank a lot of the uh, younger film like Coppola. Who they were successful, and I guess Scorsese and even even uh, George Lucas, when these smaller filmmakers started to deliver mm -hmm. financially, they go, okay, we want final cut, and that really did change yeah. the the f the face of filmmaking. Um, we're going to show our first clip from Paradise Alley, oh. but, I, but, I, but before we do, I mean, Paradise I didn't know Alley. that it still existed. <laughs> it's on a Reach and One DVD. Oh, we to track down. I can't, you know, I can't even find it on DVD. <laughs> really? Yeah. I swear. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I can't remember the. Com it's a weird company that put it out. It's not a major. Story. No, no. It's, it's for, for sure. It's a strange What's company. Yeah, yeah, I know. I forget, <laughs> forget which one it was. But could you tell us a little bit? I mean, it opens with the words as I recall, New York City, 1946. Mm. Now, you were born in 1946. It was born in 1946, right. Now, is, does that film really well up from your personal experience? No question about it. There were, uh, it's Hell's Kitchen, New York, was a very, very tough neighborhood. And uh, the way I sort of survived it is, is, in my mind, try to imagine a better place, Paradise Alley. So Paradise Alley was really a state of mind. You would go and say, God, I go to this horrible place and I live in these horrible streets, but somewhere in there is Paradise Alley, the chance to break out. So I wrote this film, which is kind of a, I guess, a surrealistic in a way, because it was not meant to be hardcore realism. It was meant to be like a state of mind, kind of a fantasy. And it, it didn't do very well because in America, they say, what is it? It's like a feathered fish. What is it a fish? Is it a bird? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I just tried to experiment with a lot of things. And we had to cut a great deal of it out because it became even more surreal. But I, I really enjoyed working with the, this is the first time I understood about camera movement and lighting. And I was trying to actually borrow, I would go to museums and look at the lighting of some of the masters, especially uh, uh, Renaissance painters, and you say, wow, 
that's fantastic. If you could just sort of get that feel. And I hired a man named uh, Vilmo Zygmunt, I mean, oh, Laszlo oh. Kovacs, yeah. who I, and, and he, he started to get me into that, uh, what I call it, like Germanic yeah. kind of lighting, yeah. How did you get it over? How did you, that, that I think would be of interest to everyone in the audience. How did you manage to pitch your first to pitch that? Uh, we had just finished Rocky, and, and I was, you know, not considered as a director at all. And I said, if I could just, uh, I said, if I, the, my thing, if I promised them a good film, a big film, they'd let me do my little film. <laughs> but more importantly, I just uh, said, I will take no fee, nothing, and, and, and if it doesn't work, I will pay you back in some way. That's, that's how it worked. It would be a little different if that were. If, actually, I wrote that before Rocky, mm -hmm. and I had sold it because I, I was very poor. I had sold the screenplay for a hundred dollars. <laughs> true, true story. About a hundred, hundred ten dollars, and the opportunity came when I went to. I went on an audition, and, um, and I didn't get the part. But I said I write a little bit. They said, "Do you happen to have anything?" I said, I had this screenplay called Paradise Alley. I brought it to the producers. They go, oh, we like this. We, we, we buy this script for $20,000. And I said, well, I don't exactly own it. I sold it for $100. <laughs> so I went and I brought those men who bought it for $100, and they hated each other. So now they said, well, we would make it, but we hate them. That's when I went, well, here's the opportunity. The door is open. And that's when I went home and started to write Rocky, because I said, ah, yeah. the door is open, I don't, but I don't have anything, yeah. see? Yeah. I said, hmm, let me think, let me think. All right, let me just write about everyday people who want an opportunity but can't get one, and I'll just put them in the body of a boxer, and that's how it all happened. One of the strong points about that film is the, the way you evoke a time and a place so well, and it's the same with Rocky, Philadelphia, and, and so on. How much time as a screenwriter do you devote to researching you know, the, in that way to get that real, authentic atmosphere? A, a lot. I, I think that when you write, you try to visualize the atmosphere as, as a, in a character. It's almost as important as your lead. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen so many films where you have an interesting premise, but the ambience, the surrounding is boring. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like there with haze and red mm -hmm. colors and what, just all these different, different diversions. So I, I spend a great deal of time uh, researching it. But usually when you get there, it, it changes. Either the weather or your philosophy. Is, you know what? Maybe I should uh, minimize. <clears throat> Maybe I yeah. should be tighter. You know, we have these grand visions. Oh, I want to do, you know, some incredible visual shot. And I say, am I doing this for myself? Is this really important to the story, mm -hmm. or should I just try to keep the character and the energy of the story going mm -hmm. and not try to show off and, and, you know, your abilities? It's, it's kind of an ongoing battle. Like in the last film with Rambo, it was a choice to... Here I had incredible vistas in Thailand and Cambodia. I'm at Cambodia and here on the border of Burma. Then I said, but this is not a story. It's a mm -hmm. story about this. Mm -hmm. It's a story about this, you know. So you have to constantly change you. Yeah. And, and also 